Meet my friends. I just pressed the let's go live button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plain of the interwebs. Booting up early on this Friday morning because we've got some fresh business to attend to that just emerged from the oven out of Fulton County. And before we unpack what's happening, let's take a look and make sure the tubes are connecting themselves, of course, on the locals, on the rumbles, on the YouTubes, and the telegrams all across America and the interwebs. It looks like we are alive and well. That's tremendous news. That means we can go ahead and get started. So let's do it, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live, the show that spotlights misconduct involving police, prosecutors, and politicians. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney, and today we're talking about Judge McAfee's ruling as it pertains to Big Fanny Willis and Nathan Wade. We've got the full opinion fresh out of the oven. We're here doing an early show so we can make sure we get this while it's still hot. And we're going to unpack what's happening inside because as you've probably already seen the headlines, Fanny's got a little bit of a decision to make. So the judge is giving her the old fork in the road, do this or else or do that. And the takeaway is that Fanny either gets rid of Nathan Wade or she gets rid of herself. And so we all think we know where this is going. But of course, there's always the possibility that Fanny decides that Nathan's not going anywhere since she loves him so much. But we're going to go through the full opinion because my initial impressions, of course, are that it is weak and not what is demanded by justice or what should be done in the court of law. And so if we think about this before we dive into it, if we think about this, if we're plotting all of this on a spectrum, you know, if we say on the one side is one extreme, on the other side is another extreme, you probably would find me based on what we saw with Fannie Willis, Nathan Wade, Terrence Bradley, all of the other witnesses, all of the cover-up attempts. We had multiple lies on the stand. We had Fannie Willis inserting herself, threatening Jocelyn Wade, Nathan's ex-wife or soon-to-be ex-wife. We had Fannie lying on her public disclosure forms, Nathan lying on his interrogatories. We had them tell us that their relationship started in 2022 when we know from Terrence Bradley's text messages that came in and from Robin Yurdy that they said this relationship started in 2019 at a judicial conference. Two witnesses corroborated that and cell phone records also confirmed that there were some shenanigans, some fanny calls happening at all hours of the night when Nathan Wade was pinging off the cell phone towers that they used to convict people there in Fulton County, by the way, when he was going over there to hang out with her for those late night canoodles, those indictments. They never laid their head to rest and all the things, right? We heard about it. Then they took the stand. They lied about this relationship. They said it started in 2022. They were very non-committal on a bunch of different things. They were being evasive, denying reality. They would ask about statements versus receipts. Oh, I don't know. Nathan Wade, what does marriage mean? What does happily married mean? What does divorce mean? Right? It was all ridiculous because these are lawyers and supposedly some of the most sophisticated lawyers in Fulton County. We know the timeline was ridiculous. Nathan Wade got appointed on November 1st, 2021. The next day he filed for divorce from his wife because he just got appointed by Big Fanny. And then they covered it all up in the aftermath, started threatening the, basically the other side, Jocelyn Wade. How dare you interfere with our election case and so on. Fannie Willis committed prosecutorial misconduct, went out in front of the church, started screaming at the other side for being racists and bigots. Why, God, why? Well, Fannie, it's because you were sleeping with Nathan, not the others. Okay, why was the white guy getting paid just a small fraction, the guy who wrote the RICO book, and Nathan Wade was getting 700K? Is it because of experience or is it because of the relationship? Clearly, there was an actual conflict of interest in the fact that if Nathan Wade from November 1st of 2021, mind you, the judge is going to frame this as though Fannie's racing this case to trial. They've been dragging their feet on this for years. The investigation started on November 1st. 
2021, when he was appointed, then they started convening their grand juries and all the things, dragged their feet for years so he could get paid. If Nathan Wade's decision after the initial investigation was to not pursue charges, there goes the Napa Valley money. There goes that cruise money. And then they came up with this fake story about cash and Fannie took it out from Publix. And they had that guy in, in California who confirmed that there was a cash payment or something like this, right? Meanwhile, they were evasive and dismissive of the questions. They were covering it up. There's evidence that Fannie Willis called Terrence Bradley and basically told him to shut his mouth. And that's not from some Trump MAGA person. That's from a prosecutor in the next county over. We also know that Gabe, the wife of a person who works for Fannie, also called Terrence and said, remember your privilege, witness tampering, covering up all of this evidence. Why? Because they were caught in a lie. And they just doubled down on it. So with all of that being said, my perspective was if we go back to our spectrum, if we plot this all on a spectrum from an outside observer, very clear that these people are liars, in my opinion, perjured themselves on the stand. And so if we're going to plot this whole thing out, you're going to find me on the side of disqualification, dismissal of the case and a referral to the AG for prosecution of criminal charges for witness tampering and perjury in my courtroom. Let's plot that on one side. But on the other side, maybe you have a situation where there is a judge finding absolutely no malfeasance at all, no conflict, no appearance of a conflict. There is no improprieties whatsoever. Fanny's doing a great job, and so this case is back on track. Right? If we plotted all this out, if we're over here and the other option is over here, the question we have today is where does this fall on the spectrum? And are there some elements that fall over here? Are there some elements that fall over here? And is there a silver lining in this? And are there other consequences that are going to be coming upon Fanny? And I think the answer to that question, of course, is yes. Now, the judge was operating in two different arenas. Of course, the court of public opinion and the court of law and He's having to navigate both these arenas and he's trying to be clever here and kind of split the baby by saying, you know, now the real DAs of Fulton County turns into survivor DA edition where now Fannie has to vote someone off the island. Either she's going or Nathan Wade's going, but we're going to get into the opinion. I do have some reaction and then we'll also talk about, as we talked about previously, some of the other remedies, right? What else might happen to Fannie? Because recall that we talked here about the worst possible outcome. And the worst possible outcome in this whole saga is not Fannie Willis stays on the case. In my opinion, a worse saga would be Fannie Willis gets booted from the case and a competent, intelligent prosecutor who is not indicting her staff, all right, at four in the morning and going to Belize would be worse for the Trump case, for the Trump defense, right? Somebody who's actually a good prosecutor who's competent would be worse, who says, okay, look, enough of this indictment stuff, get rid of the Nathan Wade, Fannie Willis stench, the odor is infecting all of Fulton County. We're gonna set that aside. And then that is going to bring the case back on track much more quickly with a lot more credibility than if Fannie stays on the case. As it stands right now, Fannie on the case is, you know, a little bit of a gift because she's such a disaster. She sucks all the energy away from the other cases. She's big Fannie Willis. She overshadows the rest of the prosecutions and becomes the symbol for the corruption that exists in these political prosecutions against Trump. So we'll talk more about that. But why are we here? Judge McAfee issued the opinion. And so let's get right to it to see what is inside and break down what's happening. Judge Scott McAfee in the big Fannie Willis prosecution of Donald Trump is here and hang on, I have to re-log into this thing over here. All right, let me 
see what's happening right here. Hang on a second. When I start the stream, Google and YouTube, they just start logging me out of stuff. I don't know why they do it, but they just like log you out. They're like, oh, oh, you're starting a stream? Oh, perfect. Here, let me log you out of all the tools that you need. And uh, it's always a fun situation when that happens. So happens it happens regularly. I don't know why they do it, but here we are. Judge McAfee, Fulton County Superior Court. He is releasing his opinion on the disqualification issue, whether Fannie Willis will be disqualified, whether Nathan Wade should be booted from the case, whether the case should be dismissed. This is what the opinion says. From Scott McAfee, the judge. This is the order on the defendant's Ashley Merchant on behalf of Michael Roman and others, their motion to dismiss the case and to disqualify Fannie Willis, the DA. Judge McAfee takes us back to January 8th. He says, back in January, defendant Michael Roman, represented by Ashley Merchant, we saw, filed a motion to dismiss the indictment and to disqualify big Fannie Willis. Now, eight co-defendants later joined Mr. Roman and supplemented the motion, raising additional grounds for disqualification. Judge McAfee gives us the breakdown here. All of these people joined in. Trump, Giuliani, Meadows, Clark, Cheeley, Schaefer, Floyd, Latham, all on the team. Now, among other allegations of disqualifying conduct, the defense contend that DA Fanny obtained a personal stake in the prosecution of this case by financially benefiting from her romantic affair with Nathan Wade, whom she personally hired to lead the state's team. So a personal stake, financial benefits, Nathan Wade, Fanny personally hired. We know the story. Now, more specifically, McAfee explains that defendant Michael Roman and Ashley Merchant, they allege that Fanny and Wade, that they traveled together on multiple vacations with Wade covering many of the associated expenses. Wade was coming out of pocket. Now, Michael Roman later supplemented his motion with receipts from some of these travels, and they admitted to those travels as well. The state responded with an affidavit arguing that Fanny had not received any financial benefit through her relationship with Wade and that their personal travel expenses were, quote, roughly divided equally. And that was from the Nathan Wade affidavit where he lied. Okay. So he said the relationship in the same affidavit. So if the judge is taking any of that affidavit as fact or accurate, accurate, you know, the the reality is if you believe the actual evidence that existed at this evidentiary hearing, their relationship started before 2022. And that means that that affidavit was inaccurate. It was a lie, in other words. So roughly divided equally is also evidence that is lacking a a shred of credibility. But the judge continues. As alleged, the claims from the defense presented a possible financial conflict of interest for Fannie. And more importantly, the defense motions and the state's response created a conflict in the evidence that could only be resolved through an evidentiary hearing. Defense says relationship started in 2019. Fanny says it started in 2022. They say there's differences of opinions because the affidavit match doesn't match the defense evidence. And so they got to lay it all out, which is what we covered. And one that could not simply be ignored without endangering the defendant's constitutional rights to procedural due process, meaning everybody gets treated the same, right? We have one procedure. Everybody goes through it appropriately. All defendants that go through Fulton County or go through any criminal justice system are afforded basic rights, right? You know what the charges are against you. You're apprised of your right to an attorney. Your release conditions are considered with a a presumption that you're innocent and these types of things. So if Trump then is being prosecuted by Fannie and Wade who have been indicting each other and Fannie appoints Wade for a conflicted reason so that she can pay him money and then go on cruises. That means that Trump and these other co-defendants, their procedural rights have been violated because there's some other ulterior motive for bringing the charges and they're not getting the same process as the others. Now, after receiving two and a half days of testimony, Judge McAfee continues. 
He says, during which the defendants were provided an opportunity to subpoena and introduce whatever relevant and material evidence that they could muster. The court finds that the defendants failed to meet their burden, McAfee, of proving that Fannie acquired an actual conflict of interest in this case through her personal relationship and recurring travels with her lead prosecutor. Leaf blower guy just showed up. He's saying hello to everybody. What's up, leaf blower guy in the house? It's going to be so nice out there. No leaves whatsoever. So Fanny says the judge, this is the big holding. Defense failed to meet their burden of proving the DA acquired an actual conflict through her personal relationship and her travels with her lead prosecutor. Now, the other alleged grounds, writes McAfee, for disqualification, including forensic misconduct, are also denied. And so this is a, a, an interesting question because this includes the church speech and some of her other prosecutorial misconduct. However, the established record, says the judge, so let's see if there's a silver lining to this. The established record now highlights a significant huh, appearance of impropriety, all right, that infects the current structure of the prosecution team, an appearance that must be removed through the state's selection of one of two options. Fulton County Survivor, season one. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part. All right, so the status quo will not be maintained. So Fanny and Wade and their little love affair is now getting broken up officially. Someone needs to go. And Fanny can go if she wants to, which she's not going to. Or Nathan Wade can go, which is more likely going to be the case. So let's continue. McAfee says, he writes about an actual conflict of interest. Here's the judge. He says, our highest courts in Georgia consistently remind us that prosecutors, like Big Fanny, are held to unique and exacting professional standards, to a unique and exacting professional standard in light of their public responsibility and their power. Every newly minted prosecutor should be instilled with the notion that she seeks justice over convictions and that she may strike hard blows, but never foul ones. You're right. Now, most importantly, prosecutors are expected to assume a role beyond a mere advocate for one side, and they must make decisions in the public's interest, not their own personal or political interest. Okay. So it sounds like you're going to disqualify her then because she was literally sleeping with Nathan Wade and taking trips grifting off the money that was coming from Fulton County as a result of his appointment that she did. His is a public duty. Fanny represents the entire public, quoting other cases. So recognizing, writes McAfee, that these are not empty slogans, nor toothless admonitions without practical effect, Georgia courts have not hesitated to step in and use their inherent authority to disqualify a state prosecutor when required, especially when that prosecutor labors under an actual conflict of interest. Referencing the Georgia Constitution, saying each court has the power to exercise powers as necessary to effectuate its judgments, and every court has power to control in the furtherance of justice, the power to conduct its officers, and all persons connected with the proceedings in the court. And courts have an independent interest in ensuring that criminal trials are conducted within the ethical standards of the profession. Wow, all this is great case law, like certainly he's going to disqualify her because she's violating all of these things. Lied to everyone in the court. Let's see if he gets there before I blow a gasket. Now, disqualification of a prosecutor, writes McAfee, due to a conflict of interest is thus not a creature of statute, right? There's no laws that really govern it so much as it is a judicial remedy. The courts have the power to administrate what's happening in their courtrooms, recognized by our appellate courts since their formation, generally on the grounds of public policy. They say as the, the administration of law should be free from all temptation and suspicion. Hmm. 
Yeah, including, you know, having a craving for a Nathan's hot dog there in Georgia. So far as human agency is capable of accomplishing that object. Bunch of case law being cited. Now, the administration of law, he says, and especially that of criminal law, this is a quote that the defense kept pulling up, should be like Caesar's wife, be above suspicion and be free from all temptation, bias or prejudice. The Georgia Supreme Court, writes McAfee, has most recently denoted conflicts of interest and forensic misconduct as two generally recognized grounds for disqualification. So two bases. And he asks about this other case. He says, you know, while this other case, McGlynn, while that indicated without citation or further explanation that disqualification allegations require a high standard of proof, neither the Court of Appeals nor any other appellate opinion has provided enlightenment on where exactly the relative, quote, high standard falls on the evidentiary spectrum. The court b- believes McGlynn offers little, if any, guidance to the analysis at hand. So the judge is kind of getting rid of this case, which is interesting because remember previously here, we talked about the different, the burdens of proof and really the three that we were talking about here was the preponderance of the evidence standard, the clear and convincing evidence standard, and the beyond a reasonable doubt evidentiary standard. And we're familiar with this. So, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, you see in the movies, you know, you know, client needs to be uh, convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. It's criminal trials. It's the highest standard we have. Then we had the one which was the low standard, which is preponderance of the evidence. And that is like 51% is enough. So if it's 51%, likely that you did something, they'll say that's enough to find you liable. Then we have clear and convincing evidence. And this was the standard. We weren't real sure where, in other words, where the standard was in this case. And the government, Fannie was saying it should be much higher. It should be somewhere up here. And they were referencing this McGlynn case. Now this is a high standard of proof, but again, that's not like an official standard under the law. So we don't know what that means. And so we're going to see if the judge gives us, you know, articulates where we are on this. But right now he's dismissing the high standard of proof as the, at least coming from the McGlynn case. So let's see what he says. And that was just one component. The other component was, do we, are we talking about actual or the appearance, right? Actual versus the appearance. And then if it is actual versus the appearance, what are the elements of that offense, right? If it's actual, does it check these, this box and this box and this box? And then the judge would determine the elements and then define what matches and then apply the evidentiary standard, whatever that happens to be. So we're at, we're, he's kind of getting into that now. Now, a conflict of interest, right? Uh, includes acquiring a personal interest or stake in the defendant's conviction. So now we're talking about the elements. It requires a personal stake. Okay, got it. And a conflict defines a conflict of interest. What is a conflict? It is a real or seeming incompatibility between one's private interests or one's public or fiduciary duties. Huh, so that seems pretty obvious, right? How about this one? What if Fannie needed to discipline Nathan Wade? Do you think her relationship might conflict with the public duties? In other words, if she needs to fire Nathan Wade because he's not writing his notes down because he keeps everything in his head, is that appropriate? Is that an appropriate relationship? There's an incompatibility that between them. She wants him coming over at four in the morning to give her the old indictment. But if she scolds him, she won't be indicted. You know, and we have a we have a conflict there. So her public duties conflict specifically with her private interests, which is strange because, you know, the judge is going to say that there's no, I guess she can stay on the case. So point is, anyways, so he references that clearly law, I think, in our favor. And in such circumstances, no showing of prejudice by a defendant is required. Okay, so it's kind of a low standard. This is so because the prosecutor's duty to the public creates an additional public interest that must remain unconflicted in every criminal case, right? So like the prosecutor is held to a higher standard, right? They should be beyond reproach. They should be like the most sanctified people in in the, the government because they are prosecuting people for other crimes. What a conflict that would be Right. If somebody's charging people with speeding tickets all day and then breaking the law speeding to work. Which which, you know, happens all the time. But a determination 
says McAfee. Now we ask a determination of whether a prosecutor is laboring, working under a conflict of interest is a fact driven one. So is there a conflict such that there's a seeming incompatibility between private and public duties? And when we ask about that, is there a seeming conflict? We have to look at the facts, says the judge. In this case, there was a finding that this is called battle versus state. There was a finding that there was insufficient evidence of a conflict after they established through testimony the attenuated nature of the connection between the lead prosecutor and the victim's mother. Okay, so prosecutor, prosecutor is prosecuting a defendant. The defendant did something bad, right? Probably, you know, somebody's life ended. Prosecutor represents the victim's mother, has a close relationship with the victim's mother, is saying that that person was also employed at the same office. And so this prosecutor was biased because they were too close to the victim. They worked together at the same office. And they said, that's, that's not enough. The prosecutor doesn't have to get off the case for that. There was not enough evidence to say that the prosecutor may have been over animated, overly aggressive, you know, overly emotional because the, the, the person who died, the mom worked in his office. Not enough. Now in this case, says the judge, sort of using that prior case as an example, he tells us in this case, Nathan Wade's manner of payment is not actionable on its own. Hmm. His manner of payment. Let's see what he means by that. From Fulton County, the billing records, the fact that Fannie Willis was the one who approved the contract that resulted in him getting the contract and the money in the first place. Whenever a private attorney like Wade, says the judge, is paid by the billable hour, a motive exists to extend or prolong the assignment. Huh. This, however, is a tension that the legal profession has long accepted. We do, right? We do. Lots of lawyers bill this way. It is also the type of speculative, quote, status violation that our courts have regularly denied as insufficient grounds for disqualification, absent solid proof of some other cr conduct. Okay, so, okay, there's a ton of other conduct. That's not, like, that's not the only piece of evidence. Let's see where this goes. So he's saying, look, you know, yeah, people bill hourly. So that alone is like not enough, which I would agree. Let's see. Finding wrongdoing cannot be imputed to an attorney based on marital status alone. All right, so now he's saying, oh, it's kind of a status. This feels very like trying to shove a square peg in a round hole. Thus, uh, Nathan's oath of office, so Nathan took an oath, in combination with the supervision theoretically provided by a neutral and detached Fanny, should generally be sufficient to dispel the appearance of that improper incentive. Okay, so the special counsel's oath of office in a normal situation, when you have a neutral and regular, like if it's not Fanny in a perfect world, it's not Nathan, it's just a regular special a prosecutor. He takes an oath. You have a, you have a non-indicting DA. They're not, you know, jousting each other at four in the morning. Should generally be sufficient to dispel the appearance of improper incentive. Okay, I would agree. Sure. But nor would a romantic relationship between prosecutors standing alone typically implicate disqualification, assuming neither prosecutor had the ability to pay the other as long as the relationship persisted. Okay. But in combination, as is alleged here by the defense, a prima facie argument arises of financial enrichment and improper motivations, which inevitably and unsurprisingly invites emotions such as this. So the judge is, you know, giving us some clarity here. He's like, well, if you take any one of these things by itself, it by itself is not a is not, you know, a bad thing. And I would agree, right? A prosecutor, like in a relationship with another prosecutor doesn't necessarily, you know, I think that happens all the time, probably. I think prosecutors probably meet each other. They're like, you know, hey, I'm, a, I'm miserable. You're miserable. Let's be miserable together. You know, and they, they, you know, find love or whatever, whatever it is prosecutors do. I don't even know what they do. Do they, do they have love? I don't know. So they have, you know, the judges is, I think, being crafty here. He's like taking out each variable and he's kind of like analyzing it one by one, shoving it back in, like into the Jenga piece. But 
that's been the defense's point this entire time, right? It's a, it's a, it's it's this accumulation, it's a cumulative totality effect that we see. So as to the financial allegations, here's what the court says. The court makes the following factual findings. Let's see if we agree with these. On November 1st, 2021, Fannie hired Wade to serve as the special assistant and lead the investigation that produced the indictment in this case. Fannie considered at least one other option before hiring Wade, and for, of course that date is true, that's in evidence. DA considered at least one option before hiring Wade, extended an, officer, an offer to Roy Barnes, the governor, he declined. And the contract allowed a $250 hourly rate, a relatively low amount by Metro Atlanta standards for an attorney with Wade's year of service and contained a ceiling on the maximum number of hours permitted. And under the and the whole and that whole formation of that was we'll see if he gets there, but the whole formation of that was very not, not above board, right? A lot of that money came from COVID money and contained a ceiling on the maximum number of hours. Now, under the terms of the first contract, Wade was not to perform more than 60 hours of work per month without written permission, and no evidence introduced indicates that Wade ever received permission to exceed these monthly caps. Now, his contract was renewed again on November 15th and again on June 12th. And again, those contract renewal dates, they were in a relationship at that time, right? Especially on this one. They were together. So she renewed her lover, gave him a new contract after the first one expired. Even if you believe that the, that the relationship started, you know, early November, uh, early 2022. Now, between October 2022 and 20, May 23, Fannie and Wade traveled together on four occasions that resulted in documentable expenses. I think it was over like six months or something, seven months. Four trips, like six months. The first included an extended trip to October 2022, so definitely in a relationship, right? October, and then she re-signs the contract, again, rehires her boyfriend, to Miami and Aruba and a cruise. Wade initially covered expenses for the October 2022 trip, totaling $5,200. So the judge confirms, makes a factual finding, Wade paid five grand. In December 2022, so we got October, December, the two flew to Miami for another cruise for which Fannie paid $1,300, $1,400 for plane tickets and Wade purchased passage for the cruise along with other vacation-related expenses totaling $3,600. In March 2023, so again, October, December, March, the two then traveled to Belize. I think that was Wade's 50th birthday where Wade covered resort and restaurant expenses in the amount of approximately 3,000 bucks. Then in May, 2023, they traveled to Napa Valley, where Wade covered airfare, lodging, and Uber rides in the amount of $2,800. In addition, the two described taking a number of day-long road trips to Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, other parts of Georgia. They weren't doing anything. They weren't doing any other work. They were just traveling around, right? And those are the expenses that we know about, right? That's what Jocelyn got her hands on. Who knows what else they did, you know, like just think about it. If they're if they're traveling around all over the place, this is what they've you know, not they didn't introduce any evidence of any other trips, right? All this was what the defense was able to cobble together and there's no real mandate that they disclose that any anything else than other other than what the defense was able to cobble together. So they also admitted to dining out, this is McAfee writing, to dining out on multiple occasions and taking turns covering the bill. That's what they admitted to. That's what they testified to, taking turns. If you believe their testimony, which uh, it's hard to believe anybody does, with seemingly full access to Wade's primary credit card statements. Uh, I don't think so. To Wade's primary credit card statements. The defendants did not produce evidence of any further documentable expenses or gifts, nor were any revealed through the testimony. Okay, come on, judge. You know who had full access to Wade's primary credit card statements and bank records? Nathan Wade. Where, where did he produce, what did he produce to corroborate any of his claims? Nothing. Neither did Fanny. 
and they've got a duty of candor to the court. So the defense, the judge is kind of, I think, over overextending to the defense this idea that they have seemingly full access. Like, come on, that's way overbroad there, judge. They got this by happenstance through Jocelyn Wade and the divorce. This whole thing was barely cracked open. It don't act like they had like Wade's, you know, login account. He could hop onto the Amex and see what's going on. And by the way, Nathan Wade also used Terrence Bradley's credit card, apparently for a trip. So this is BS, okay? There was money that was being used on other credit cards. Now let's see if he gets to that, but Terrence Bradley testified that Nathan Wade used to swipe his card. For what? A trip. Ashley Merchant got that out. So yeah, they didn't have access to Terrence Bradley's credit card or to Fannie Willis's credit card. So the judge is, you know, keeping the burden on them. But the, the, gov the government, the prosecutor's office could have easily rebutted that and they didn't. Now in total, the defendants point to an aggregate documented benefit of at most approximately 12 grand to 15 grand in Fannie's favor. So the judge even admits 12,000 to 15,000 bucks, okay, to her benefit. And remember that the gift provisions that Fannie was supposed to report on was only $100. She was supposed to report any gift and Nathan Wade was a qualified person covered by that statute. Judge McAfee writes, Fannie and Wade, they testified that these expenditures were not meant as gifts. Yeah, yeah, because they can't define that. They don't even know what it means and not designed to benefit the DA. Th okay, that's interesting. So can they use that defense? Uh, this was not designed as a drug transaction. This was not designed to, to benefit someone, right? This, this, this transaction for sale. It's crazy. They, they, she, for, she, there's two clear benefits. One, she's on a cruise on a vacation, indulging herself, probably getting pampered, drinking her gray goose. And number two, she had her boyfriend with her. And she got to provide a forum for him to leave, right? If he's working, slaving away at his private office, he's got to deal with clients, phone calls, all this crap. All she does is just bring her boyfriend, right? DA and special counsel Wade, they're going on a meeting, leave him alone, right? So she not only like has the, the benefit of the consortium of her lover, much better to go with your boyfriend than it is to go alone, right, Fanny? And she also provides this new environment, this professional environment where he can get away apparently every other month and no one bothers them. So it was not designed to benefit Fanny. Clearly it was, clearly. Now both testified that Fanny regularly reimbursed Wade in cash, you know. Very common. Fanny testified that if Someone says it's, it's, it's a thousand. It's going to be a G. She says, I'll give him a thousand. I give him a grand. If it's going to be a G, I'll give him a grand. No problem. So she testified that she went to Publix and got a bunch of money and she kept it in cash and she kept it at her house because her daddy told her to do that. And you know, white people don't understand. And so if not reimbursed, because she paid in cash, if not reimbursed, then Fanny covered a comparable or related expense. So you buy breakfast and lunch, I'll get dinner. Okay, even Stevens. For example, Fanny testified that she reimbursed Wade in cash for the Aruba trip, which estimated she cost, said around two grand, and that she gave him money for both, both cruises. She further claimed that she reimbursed Wade for the entirety of the Belize trip, and that she paid for the Napa Valley excursions. And finally, while Wade could have bought meals in 2020, which totaled more than $100, she would also regularly pay for his meals. And 2020 is well before the relationship started, according to them. They said 2022. Why were they having lunch in 2020? So is he admitting that that relationship happened in 2020? Finally, while Wade could have bought meals in 2020, which totaled more than 100, maybe because that's on her disclosure form, 
She would also regularly pay for his meals. Well, that sounds like boyfriend-girlfriend material in 2020. Hopefully the judge recognizes that. Because they lied to you, judge, in their affidavit. They said their relationship started later in 22. All right. Now, such reimbursement, says Judge McAfee, and such a practice may be unusual, huh? and the lack of any documentary corroboration is understandably concerning. <laughs> Yet the testimony withstood direct contradiction. Yeah, because you can't refute it, right? Isn't that the beautiful thing about cash? Man, I hope, I hope all of those people being prosecuted for any, any illegal transaction in Fulton County are reading this one. No, we just transact, we, we transacted in cash. You can't track anything, right? Here's my, here's my alibi. You can't track it because it was all done in cash. No, we reimbursed, it was all done. So yet the testimony withstood direct contradiction. It was corroborated by other evidence, this judge. For example, her payment of airfare for two of the 2022 Miami trips. So he's like, see, she did reimburse him one time, so she probably reimbursed him all the other times, and it's unusual but they can't prove that they didn't do it and was not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable. Well, the, the problem judge is that they don't have any credibility. All right. So yes, a credible person who was honest and didn't lie about when their relationship started and didn't try to threaten witnesses and try to cover this up by shifting Terrence Bradley's testimony and by having gay banks get phone calls from Nathan Wade's friend, makes their credibility absolutely unbelievable, not inherently unbelievable. So however, as the DA herself acknowledged, no ledger exists, obviously, because it's fake. Other than a best guesstimate, there is no way to be certain that expenses were split completely evenly, and Fannie may well have received a net benefit of several hundred dollars. Now, despite, yeah, okay. The DA may well have received a benefit. Of, this is like pure speculation. She may have received a benefit of $15,000. We can both play that stupid game. Yeah, you're right. We don't know. Do you know why we don't know? Because Fannie and Nathan lied about it. They, didn't cut, they, did, they covered it up. And even if you say they didn't lie or cover it up, they still were, were dishonest in their divorce interrogatories and their public disclosure forms unusual it's dishonest they filled out their forms as with li as with lies with lies filled with lies so okay judge let's see despite this after considering all the surrounding circumstances the court finds that the evidence did not establish that fanny's receipt of a material financial benefit as a result of her decision to hire and engage in a romantic relationship with wade so did not establish that there was a material financial benefit, which is just like, come on, guys, are you serious now? If you're going to try to take your significant other on five, four different official big trips and multiple different day trips, it's easier to do that if they don't have to ask their boss, who is making sure that they continue to get paid, they don't need to ask for permission, right? Because you're their boss. Fanny just says, yeah, you're good. Let's go rather than saying to somebody who's actually working, why aren't you in your office doing your job that you're getting paid to do? So it's a material financial benefit in that she got like actual money and the, the, the benefit is material because she spent time with her boyfriend on these vacations and you have to pay for that. That benefit comes from being able to afford it and pay for it. Now, simply put, says McAfee, the defendants have not presented sufficient evidence indicating that the expenses were not roughly evenly divided or that Fanny or currently was or currently remains greatly and pecuniarily, pecuniarily interested in the prosecution. So the judge, again, like the judge is really making a narrow standard. He wants like money. Like, did, did Nathan Wade give Fannie Willis a big fat lottery check? Like, here you go, baby. Here's a check. Here you go. No, he didn't do that. 
But clearly, he went on a bunch of different trips that he would not have been able to go on at the cadence and the, and the pace that he went on with her without this assignment. So that is just a total cop-out. Now, McAfee continues. In addition, and he says, and much more important, the court finds based largely on Fanny's testimony, which was a total lie, because she corroborated, signed off on Nathan Wade's affidavit, based largely on Fanny's testimony that the evidence demonstrated that the financial gain flowing from her relationship with Wade was not a motivating factor on the part of Fanny's decision to indict and prosecute this case. Oh my gosh. While a general motive for more income can never be disregarded entirely, Fanny was not financially destitute throughout this time or in any great need. And she, oh my gosh, as she testified, her salary exceeds $200,000 per year without any indication of excessive expenses or debts. This is pathetic. Similarly, so Fanny had money, so she's not going to grift other money, right? So that's like a great defense for anybody who's ever been charged with any crime. Uh, I would never do that because I don't need that. Right, every shoplifting charge. I, I, why would I steal that? I already have one at home. Oh, I guess you already have one at home. I guess you didn't do this bad thing then. So, the the motive was clearly they they had a whole book written about her. Okay, she was going to be this new leader of anti-Trump TDS mania, going to elevate her profile, and. This would set her entire future up by prosecuting this case. So don't act like, like, you know, $17,000, I can see where the judge is going, like $17,000, $15,000 is just a small slice of the pie for someone who gets 200 grand a year. And she's not spending wildly. She's not at the casino blowing stuff on Grey Goose. She just likes Grey Goose in moderation, even though they go, they go on four cruises. Now, of course, Fanny could, could show us that she would go on these cruises anyways, right? Fanny could walk us back through her timeline and tell us that she regularly goes on cruises. Nathan Wade and their new lover relationship didn't change her course of conduct. She's already been doing this for years, likes to go on cruises once every other month or trips every other month, which is amazing for a public servant, right? So Nathan came in, nothing changed or did it. Did these things start happening once he started getting this cash flow rolling? Now, similarly, the court finds that the defense have failed to demonstrate that Fannie's conduct has impacted or influenced the case to the defense's detriment. It's such a ridiculous, like he is overlooking the entire point. This case would not have been brought or prosecuted had it not gone to her lover. She took it to the governor, Roy Barnes, and said, will you please take this case? He says, you're crazy, get out of here. No one else wanted to touch it. So she says, how about you, honey? Then Nathan Wade gets the contract, meaning the, in the inception, the birth of this entire case came from the Fannie and Wade corruption. The entire prosecution is to the defense's detriment. And the relationship of Fannie and Willis started in 2019 before he was appointed to begin the case in 2021, November. So while prejudice is not a required element for disqualification, it's relevant to considerations of due process and the defense request of remedy of complete dismissal. Well, they were clearly prejudiced. The entire bringing of the case has prejudiced every one of them. Now, defense and the defendants argue that the financial arrangement created an incentive to prolong the case. But in fact, there is no indication that Fannie is interested in delaying anything. Indeed, the record is quite the contrary. Oh my gosh. But the relationship, before the relationship came to light, the state requested the trial begin less than six months after the indictment. Yeah, obviously. Oh my gosh, this is so dishonest. I can't even take it. Let's see. Judge, you're starting from the wrong starting point, my friend. Okay, the indictment was in August of 2023. But this case 
had been being jerked around for two years before that. So the timeline, obviously, is November 1, right? November 1 is where Nathan Wade's appointment came into this. That's the starting point. So November 1, 21, that's where we begin. This case has been meandering around for multiple years. Then the judge says that immediately after the indictment, around 8-16-23, now Fanny's suddenly saying, wow, we have to go to trial immediately. And the judge says, well, because she wanted six months, so from August 6, 16-23, to you know, April, May-ish next year of the 24, the judge is saying that six months is very fast, right? Wow, the judge is saying six months from this starting point to the trial date. Wrong, judge. This started when Nathan Wade got appointed all the way back here. So don't give us this garbage like the state requested that trial Nathan Wade got paid here, judge, not at the time of the indictment, and the judge knows that. Before the relationship came to light, the state requested that trial begin less than six months. Fanny's going very quickly. What? Soon thereafter, the state opposed severance of the objecting defendants who did not demand their statutory right to a speedy. This is all nonsense, okay, because the judge started at the wrong starting point. The judge started is starting at, at after the indictment was filed. But the re, this is so unfair because the reason that they want to go fast is so Trump doesn't have time to prepare, obviously. So six months, she's like, yeah, perfect. We've been working on this case since 2021. Fannie and Nathan, so-called, have been working on this case when they're not indicting each other or going on vacays. So they've got two and a half years of preparatory work on this or however many years it is, two years. And then Trump gets six months. It's a tactical advantage. That's why she's hurrying and she's got to get it done before the election. And she knows that six months, if she asks for a, a trial date in April, that you're going to deny it, po postpone it back. So it's not hurrying for the sake of judicial efficiency or to minimize Nathan Wade's costs. That's insane because she was jerking around for two years. Soon thereafter, the state opposed severance because again, that would have delayed past the election who did not demand their statutory right to a speedy trial. The state argued that it, it only wanted to try the case once, assuming that the trial would have been affirmed and any necessary post-conviction appeals would come through. The state amended its proposed timeline in November 23 to request the trial commence less than one year after the return of the indictment, which came in August. Yeah, they have to now squeeze it in before the election. So the judge is using their election acceleration requests as evidence that this is not a grift. And even before the indictment, Fannie approved a grand jury presentment that included fewer defendants than the special purpose grand jury recommended. In sum, okay, so now he's talking about some of these dates, but Nathan was getting paid all, for all of that. Now, in sum, Fannie has not in any way acted in conformance with the theory that she arranged a financial scheme to enrich herself or endear herself to Wade. And nobody made that argument, endear herself to Wade. The argument was they, got, they hooked up at a CLE in 2019. By extending the duration of this prosecution or engaging in excessive litigation. This is total hogwash, man. This is a coat big time. He's, he pick, he picked, he's intentionally picked the wrong time. He started two years after this case actually started and then said, see, this case is going fast. It's a total cop out, man. Actually, it's pathetic. Now, without sufficient evidence that Fannie acquired a personal stake in the prosecution, which she did, Nathan wouldn't have gotten that money to go take her on cruises or that her financial arrangements had any impact on the case, their claim of an actual conflict must be denied. Now, this finding, says the judge, which is so pathetic, this finding is by no means 
an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse in judgment. It kind of does. I mean, if you're not going to do anything about it or the unprofessional manner of D.A. Willis's testimony during the evidentiary hearing. It was it was unprofessional. She was screaming, had to get scolded. Rather, it is the judge's opinion that Georgia law does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices. Okay. Even repeatedly, and it's the trial court's duty to confine itself to the relevant issues and applicable law properly brought before it. So he said, I I disagree with this. I think it's bad, but the law doesn't allow me to do anything. It's just a bad choice. There's no actual conflict, which is absolutely ridiculous, right? The prosecution, if, if Nathan Wade, just, just go down the, the, the opposite hypothetical. If Nathan Wade said, listen, Fanny, baby, I love you, but I've reviewed this case. There's nothing we can do here. I'm competent and we need, we need to not bring this indictment. That's it. There's no, there's no more billing. There's no 2021 or, or the remainder of the 21 contract. There's no 2022 contract. There's no 2023 contract. It's all gone. Nathan has to go back and slave away with Terrence Bradley. So clearly her lover got a gig that is a benefit to her. Now, other forums or sources of authority like the General Assembly, the Georgia Ethics Commissions, the Georgia Bar, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, and the voters of Fulton County, they may offer feedback on any unanswered questions that linger. But those are not issues determinative to the defendant's motions alleging an actual conflict. And so we're going to allow other people to deal with the perjury and the witness tampering that happened in my courtroom. Tough, tough judge, real, real, real nicely done. So they can get in there, submit false affidavits. Terrence Bradley can literally lie on the stand and, you know, misremember, speculative himself out of it, disagree with your rulings about attorney client privilege and all the things. And other people can deal with it. Ethics committee, state bar, they'll deal with it. Got it. Nice punt. So he then talks about Judge McAfee, about the appearance of impropriety. He says, finding insufficient evidence of an actual conflict does not end the inquiry. Now, our appellate courts have endorsed the application of an appearance of impropriety standard to state prosecutors even without any explicit finding of an actual conflict. So you can use that standard. Let's see if how it applies. Now, certainly a conflict of interest, this case, or the appearance of impropriety from a close personal relationship with the victim may be grounds for disqualification of a prosecutor, citing another case. Another one says a DA may not be compensated by means of a fee arrangement, which guarantees at least an appearance of a conflict of interest. Another case says, a prosecutor's close personal relationship with the victim in a case may create at least the appearance of a prosecution that's unfairly based on private interests rather than one based on public interests. And another case granted a new trial after concluding that under such circumstances, there is at least an appearance of impropriety. So a lot of cases that seem to favor the defense. But McAfee says, the cases that I cited here that resulted in the disqualification of the DA did not hold that an actual conflict is a necessary prerequisite. So you don't even have to get to the upper echelon high standard of actual conflict. The state nevertheless argues that the facts presented suggested as much And while that may be so in some instances, the opinions did not make that finding. And this court cannot ignore the explicit language of the Georgia Supreme Court and multiple opinions from the Georgia Court of Appeals. And further, while Davenport, that case, is the first instance this court can find where the exact phrase of, quote, appearance of impropriety is used to assess the disqualification of a state prosecutor, the reference to Caesar's wife in Nichols and the admonition against all temptation and suspicion in Galden demonstrate that the principle has long been endorsed in Georgia law. We don't like even the appearance of impropriety. 
And he also references us to this footnote, saying the appearance verbiage likely owes its lineage to Canon 9 of the Code of Professional Responsibility. The rules say a lawyer should avoid even the appearance of professional impropriety, which affects all aspects of an attorney's professional life. That rule has been criticized. Georgia eventually supplemented its professional code. Now, despite its removal as an explicit requirement, Georgia appellate courts continue to apply an appearance standard in both criminal and civil contexts. Okay. McAfee writes, now, while formally undefined in Georgia precedent, an appearance of impropriety is generally considered, quote, conduct or status that would lead a reasonable person to think that the actor is behaving or will be inclined to behave inappropriately or wrongfully. So this comes from Black's Law Dictionary. It's an official dictionary that lawyers use, and it's not racist, probably. But it says, conduct or status that would lead a reasonable person to think the actor is behaving inappropriately or wrongfully. Reasonable person, an objective standard. Judge says, so borrowing from federal judicial recusal standards, the judge says a reasonable person is not an uninformed member of the public with only a passing knowledge of the facts at hand. The standard, this must be the standard as otherwise in this causal uninformed or misinformed observer might believe that Fannie must recuse herself merely because her father shares a last name with a co-defendant, right? What is the standard? Is it if somebody says that Roberta Kaplan and Judge Kaplan in the E. Jean Carroll case, maybe they're a little bit too closely related, so one of them has to go. Somebody on the street might have that perception, but that's not what a reasonable person would say is the standard. A reasonable person would know, well, they're not related, and so that alone is not enough. So the reasonable person about whether someone should go or not, whether it's hype, says, nor is a reasonable person a person who's hypersensitive, you know, or unduly suspicious. Like, that's, a, that's illegal. That's got to go. So without understanding the relevant legal standards or the judicial practice. So now we're trying to define what this reasonable person is. Now, the appearance standard has also been defined and regularly applied as part of the Code of Judicial Conduct. They say the test for an appearance of impropriety is whether, ask ourselves, could the situation create in reasonable minds like ours our perception that the judge or the person's ability to carry out their responsibilities with integrity, with impartiality, and with competence is impaired? If we, if we applied that to Fanny and Nathan, we'd ask ourselves, did they act in a manner which would impair their ability to act with integrity, impartiality, or competence? Yes to all three. Now, in contrast, only an attorney's professional behavior is subject to scrutiny through disqualification, and nor is a private attorney held to the strict nonpartisan standards of a judge. So to say that an appearance standard of inappropriately holds prosecutors to the same ethical standards as judges is inaccurate. Although the distinction is less apparent here as the conduct at issue involves intermingling the professional and personal life of the DA. McAfee continues. He says, all right. The appearance standards recognizes that even when no actual conflict exists, a perceived conflict in the reasonable eyes of the public threatens confidence in the legal system itself, right? When this danger goes uncorrected, it undermines the legitimacy and the moral force of our already weakest branch of government, which is a point we make here regularly. Okay, the Legislative branch has the power of the purse. Congress can take and spend money. Very powerful. The executive branch, the presidency, has the ability to use the FBI or to prosecute a case, right? And do a bunch of other things to execute the law. The judiciary relies on its legitimacy. And if you have a judge that allows people to come into his courtroom and lie about their prior misconduct, that undermines the legitimacy and the moral force of our weakest branch of government. There is no other enforcement mechanism. The judiciary's judgment will be obeyed only so long as the public respects it. That's from the Federalist Papers. Now thus it is, now that's interesting, right? 
we have talked about this with John Roberts. John Roberts, of course, we know he saved the Obamacare opinion. 5-4 decision, he joined with the left, and he just modified it to make it a tax. So we can all have Obamacare now, which apparently I think is healthcare is still a problem, I think. Weird. So when the court does that, when the court splits the baby, which is basically what we're doing here, we ask ourselves, is the judge trying to keep the, you know, the, the judiciary's credibility intact? I don't buy it for a minute. Her lies, her dishonesty, Nathan's cover-up attempts shatters the credibility of the court much more than administering just, justice here would. But McAfee continues. He says thus, it is sometimes an attorney guiltless in any actual sense, nevertheless is required to take the to, to stand aside. An attorney who did nothing wrong has to take a side for the sake of public confidence in the probity of the administration of justice. McAfee says this court finds that it can and indeed must consider the appearance of impropriety as a basis for Fannie's disqualification, especially in recognition of the critical role that the prosecutor plays in our justice system. And he says, one final observation can be gleaned from a careful study of our appellate decisions, applying this standard. When we apply this standard, the remedy can vary. Unlike an actual conflict, the finding of an appearance of impropriety does not automatically demand disqualification. Our Supreme Court has previously analyzed disqualification under an appearance standard in a civil case, and they used a continuum. They recognize that disqualification is not always the appropriate outcome. In that prior case, here's what the judge said. At the one end of the scale, where disqualification is always justified and indeed mandated, even when balanced against the client's right to choose his lawyer, the appearance of impropriety coupled with the conflict or jeopardy to a client is, is still justified. Now, in these instances, it's clear that the disqualification is necessary for the protection of the client. Somewhere in the middle of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on conduct on the part of the attorney. As discussed above, this generally has been found insufficient to outweigh the client's interest in counsel of choice. This is probably so because absent danger to the client, the nebulous interest of the public at large and the propriety of the bar of the lawyers of the law is not weighty enough to justify disqualification. And finally, at the opposite end of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on not on conduct, but on status alone, and that is insufficient grounds for disqualification. So interesting, he used the scale, as we talked about at the start, to try to disambiguate the different contexts that exist. Now, the Supreme Court further notes that disqualification due to an appearance of impropriety should rarely occur where there is no danger that the actual trial will not be tainted. In other words, sounds like materiality. Yeah, maybe it was bad, but it doesn't impact the underlying case. It was only professional, uh, only personal, not professional. Here's another case, Second Circuit, 1979 says, when there is no claim that the trial will be tainted, appearance of impropriety is simply too slender a read on which to rest a disqualification order except in the rarest of cases. So you need a little bit more than that. Although the Court of Appeals found the existence of an appearance of impropriety, it noted that the appearance could be cured through screening the affected prosecutor from participation in the remainder of the case. And moreover, to ensure that no conflict of interest or appearance of one might develop, the DA took the prudent step of ordering the investigator to take no part in the investigation or the prosecution of this case. So the judge found this as a model and he's just going to run with it. He found this 1994 case called Billings. He's like, I'm just, I love this. I'm just going to screen out the bad guy. So the cases indicate that a court, trial court, can consider alternative solutions to cure the appearance of impropriety. Yeah, good luck with that, Judge. Good luck. Nor would the finding of an appearance of impropriety on the part of Fanny herself, in contrast to an actual conflict, which in my opinion she clearly has, 
necessarily result in the disqualification of the entire office. The DA in the other case, McLaughlin, was absolutely disqualified due to a personal interest. And as a result, assistant DAs that were appointed by the DA, they lacked any authority to proceed. Now, McLaughlin did not address an appearance standard and made a point to limit total disqualification to instances of absolute disqualification. When the appearance of a conflict exists, only the affected prosecutor, if they're elected or appointed, is affected. The individual prosecutor who has the conflict may be disqualified from participation, but not all the other prosecutors who work for him. So with these principles in mind, says the judge, Judge McAfee, the court finds that the record made at the evidentiary hearing established that Fannie's prosecution is encumbered by an appearance of impropriety. Okay, now this appearance is not created by mere status alone but comes because of the specific conduct and impacts more than a mere nebulous public interest because it concerns a public prosecutor. Even if the romantic relationship began after Wade's initial contract in November, Fanny chose to continue supervising and paying Wade while maintaining that relationship. And such further, she further allowed the regular and the loose exchange of money definitely was a loose exchange between them without any exact or verifiable measure of reconciliation. A lot of exchanges there. This lack of confirmed financial split creates the possibility and the appearance of Fanny's benefit, albeit non-materially, from a contract whose award lay solely within her purview and policing. Wow. Yeah. So he's acknowledging all that is true, but he's going to keep her on the case or give them the option. Now, most importantly, were the case allowed to proceed unchanged, the prima facie concerns, like the facial concerns of just having these two together, raised by the defense would persist. Yeah, we even were commenting on it when she was there sitting next to him at the bench. We, they had to separate themselves. They had two chairs in between them because it would have looked really weird if they were leaning over one another. As Fanny testified, her relationship with Wade has only cemented after these motions, and she said our relationship is, quote, stronger than ever. Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation for the inaccurate interrogatories, judge, those are called lies, okay? Okay, patently unpersuasive. A lie, a cover-up. For the inaccurate interrogatories he submitted in his pending divorce case indicates a willingness on his part to wrongly conceal his relationship with Fanny. Again, a lie. There is no explanation. He lied on the interrogatories, Judge, and then lied about lying on the interrogatories. Now, as the cases move forward, reasonable members of the public could easily be left to wonder whether the financial exchanges have continued resulting in some form of benefit to Fanny. That's right. Reasonable members could. Or even when the romantic relationship has resumed, whether it has resumed, probably has. But put differently, an outsider could reasonably think that Fanny is not exercising her independent professional judgment totally free of any uncompromising or, uh, or compromising influences. And so Judge McAfee says, as long as Wade remains on the case, this unnecessary perception will persist. Says the testimony introduced, including of DA, Fannie, and Wade, did not put these concerns to rest. During argument, the defense focused largely pivoted from the financial concerns to disproving the testimony of Fanny, namely that her romantic relationship actually predated the hiring of Wade. On that front, the court makes a few brief observations. First, the court finds itself unable to place any stock in the testimony of Terrence Bradley. So he's not credible. No stock. His inconsistencies, his demeanor, his generally non-responsive effort answers left far too brittle a foundation upon to build any conclusions. 
other than he's helping Fannie cover up. While prior inconsistent statements can be considered as substantive evidence under Georgia law, which are the text message, Bradley's impeachment by text message did not establish the basis for which he claimed such sweeping knowledge of Wade's personal affairs. So he just says, yeah, they had a relationship, but he didn't say how he knew that they had a relationship. And the judge says, well, we don't know. There's no foundation. He says, for that reason, the court finds it unnecessary to reopen evidence to consider the testimony of the prosecutor or Manny Aurora as proffered by defendants Schaefer and Latham, respectively. So no law professor who says that Terrence Bradley, this is so ridiculous, no testimony from the law professor who said Terrence Bradley told him that, that there was a relationship between Nathan and Fanny, or no testimony from the prosecutor. Now, the prosecutor also confirmed that the relationship started before Fanny and Nathan Wade lied about it in 2022. It's, they say it started in 2019. Terrence Bradley told both of them that. But Cindy Yeager, the other reason to have her back is not just because of that statement. So the judge is going to probably skip over this. Let's see. But Cindy Yeager says she heard Fanny call Terrence Bradley and say, they're coming after us, you don't have to say anything. So yeah, it, it might be unnecessary to hear from Cindy about what Terrence Bradley said, because Terrence Bradley told her the same thing, told Manny the same thing, told Ashley the same thing, that there was a relationship that started in 2019. Cindy wouldn't add any more to that, so we don't need to hear more about that, that's fine. But Cindy would tell that Fanny was calling Terrence to shut him up, which implicates her in the sanctity of the very hearing. The judge just fails to mention that. Now, in addition, while the testimony of Robin Yurdy raised doubts about the state's assertions, it ultimately lacked context and detail. Even after considering the proffered cell phone testimony from the defense and Trump, along with the entirety of the other evidence, neither side was able to conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence when the relationship evolved into a romantic one. Oh my gosh. Those cell phone records clearly showed that there was a lot of 4 a.m. It's, ridic it's ridiculous. Preponderance of the evidence is 51% or not. It's a low standard. More likely than not. Is it more likely than not that they had a romantic relationship when Fanny would call him at 1130 at night, he'd get in the car, go over there, do the indictment business, go back home, say, good to see you, baby, I'm home safe. And all of the other witnesses, clearly it's over 51%. It was romantic, so the judge is not going to address their perjury because he's going to say, uh, I can't tell when the relationship started. I don't know when it started. I don't know. So there is no lie because he can't figure it out, right? He saves himself having to make a very tough decision. I don't know when the relationship started. Robin Yurdy's not that credible. And uh, all of the other evidence is not even 51% likely. You be the judge and jurors on that one, okay? 51%, give me a break. Doesn't even meet preponderance of the evidence. Yeah, right. He says, however, an odor of mendacity remains. It does stink. That's true, judge. A lot stinks there in Fulton. The court is not under an obligation to ferret out every instance of potential dishonesty from each witness or defendant ever presented in open court. Uh, no one was asking you to do that, Judge. Thanks for setting a standard that's impossible to reach and then measuring yourself against that and then blaming us for holding you to that standard. No one was asking for that. It's the DA of Fulton County. At her, that's all. Such an expectation would mean an end to the efficient disposition of criminal and civil proceedings. No one's asking you to do that. Like you don't have to get into Yurdy and Terrence and all. It's Fanny. Did she lie? She's the DA. Yet reasonable questions about whether Fanny and her hand selected lead Wade, reasonable questions about whether her and Wade testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship further underpin the finding of an appearance of impropriety and the need to make proportional efforts to cure it. Reasonable questions about whether they lied. Yeah. Now, ultimately, 
Dismissal of the indictment, says McAfee, is not the appropriate remedy to adequately dissipate the financial cloud of impropriety and potential untruthfulness here. Saying, referencing other cases, that dismissal of an indictment is an extreme sanction used only sparingly as a remedy for unlawful government conduct. There has not been a showing that the defense's due process rights have been violated or that the issues involved prejudice the defendants in any way. Absolutely ridiculous. The indictment is unlawful. There was a corrupt relationship between the two of them that led to the birth of this indictment. The entire prosecution prejudices the defense. The entire case is a due process right violation. Nor is disqualification of a constitutional officer like Fannie necessary when a less drastic and sufficiently remedial option is available. What a cop. The court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. Okay. So he's just going to like separate the high school, the high schoolers. Okay. Like dad comes home, son's in, you know, get out of, you know, Hey, your door is open when you're in there, keep your door open and, and separate yourselves. The district attorney may choose to step aside along with her whole office and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. Fanny's obviously not going to do that. Or alternatively, Nathan Wade can withdraw, allowing Fanny the defendants and the public to move forward without his presence or the remuneration distracting from and potentially compromising the merits of the case. Okay, so it's like an HR company. It's like, well, one of you are getting fired, so one of you are gone, so go. Which is a wild uh, interpretation. So he's basically acknowledging, right, that Fanny was bad and Nathan was bad. But only one of them has to go. We can keep one bad, lying, dishonest prosecutor, but you can't have two. You can have one, but not two. If you try to get two of them in here, that's really bad. But if only one of you is lying and dishonest, well, we can live with that. But Fanny, you now have to choose who stays on the island or who goes. That's the judge's solution. So he's acknowledging there's a pretty serious problem. Sounds like if if there is no actual conflict and there's only the appearance, but you have no, apparently you find cred, Fanny to be credible because you couldn't put a, a start date on the relationship, then, then why should there be any removal? Because of the odor? Now, okay, here's the judge. He says, also talk about forensic misconduct. The Georgia Supreme Court also recognizes forensic misconduct or improper comment by the state as grounds for disqualification. One example of such forensic misconduct is, quote, expression by the prosecuting attorney of his personal belief in the defendant's guilt. Another case found that a pretrial public comment by a prosecutor that a conviction would be, quote, the right result constituted an impermissible but not disqualifying expression of the opinion about the merits of the case. The right result. Now, another case was overruled on other grounds. Now, as guidance, Williams instructs the trial court, says the judge should, quote, take into consideration whether the remarks, like Fanny's, were part of a calculated plan, evincing a design to prejudice the defense in the minds of the jurors, and whether such remarks were inadvertent utterances. So balance these things out. Williams also notes that while a prosecutor's comments may be considered improper, they must be egregiously improper as to justify disqualification. McAfee continues, saying this court has not located, nor has been provided with, a single additional case exploring the relevant standards for forensic misconduct, or an opinion that actually resulted in a dis disqualification under Georgia law. And so left unexplored, therefore, is how other examples of forensic misconduct can manifest, such as whether the statements that stop short of commenting on the guilt can be disqualifying, nor has it been decided if some showing of prejudice is required and how a trial court should go about determining whether that prejudice exists. 
nor is it clear whether the analysis differs depending on the pretrial posture of the case. So, so I, you know, there's no standards for me to apply here. So unmoored from precedent, the court feels confined to the boundaries of Williams and restricts the application of the facts here to its limited holding. Saying Trump and the defense and Roman and Merchant, they have exhaustively documented every public comment made by Fannie about this case. They've done that in their motions and in their filings. And many of these have already been addressed through a pretrial challenge made on similar grounds brought by Trump and Latham previously. And so this court uh, incorporates and adopts the sound reasoning of Judge McBurney and finds that the comments made by Fannie prior to July 31st did not amount to disqualifying misconduct. Saying public comments about the need for and the importance of the investigation fall far short of bias explicit that must be found to remove them. And similarly, more recent comments describing the charges in the indictment, the procedural posture of the case, the office's conviction rates, the personal behind the scenes anecdotes are not disqualifying. Fannie can do whatever she wants, whenever she wants, all the time with no consequences. This includes Fannie's unorthodox decision to make on the record comments and authorize members of her st staff to do the same. Now, the author's intent on publishing a book about the grand jury investigation during the pendency of the case, that's all her prerogative. And those decisions may have ancillary prejudicial effects yet to be realized, but the comments do not rise to the level of disqualification under the case law, and so I can't boot her for that. Now, the same cannot be so easily said of Fannie's prepared speech before the church on January. In these public and televised comments, Fannie complained that a Fulton County commissioner and, quote, so many others questioned her decision to hire Wade. When referring to her detractors throughout the speech, she frequently utilized the plural called they. Now, the state says the speech was not aimed at any of the defendants. Yeah, right. Judge says maybe so, but maybe not. Therein lies the danger of public comment by a prosecuting attorney. By including a reference to, quote, so many others on the heels of Roman's motion, which instigated the entire controversy, Fannie left that question open for the public. The court finds, after considering the statement as a whole, under all the circumstances surrounding its issuance, that Fannie's speech did include Michael Roman and his counsel, whether it was intentional or not. McAfee says it's also worth noting is that there may be an issue of standing for the other five defendants' challenge of this speech. Although counsel for Trump expressed in open court the possibility that he would join the motion after his own investigation, each defendant only formally joined Roman's motions challenging the hiring of Wade after the speech had been made. Saying more at issue, McAfee continues, instead of attributing the criticism to a criminal accused general aversion to being convicted and going to jail, Fannie ascribed the effort as motivated by, quote, playing the race card. She went on to frequently refer to Wade as, quote, a black man, while her other unchallenged state, uh, special prosecutors were labeled one white woman and one white man, both of whom she didn't sleep with, racist. Now, the effect of this speech was to cast racial aspersions at the indicted defendant's decisions to file this motion. Clearly. But, however, but. The speech did not specifically mention any defendant by name. So, Although not improvised or inadvertent, it also did not address the merits of the indicted offenses in an effort to move the trial itself or the court of public opinion. So it was bad, but it wasn't that bad. Nor did it dis disclose sensitive or confidential evidence that has yet to be revealed or admitted at trial. And in addition, the case is too far removed from the jury to establish a permanent taint of the jury pool. What? At best, as best it can divine, under the sole direction of Williams, the court cannot find that the speech crossed the line to the point where the defendants have been denied the opportunity to a fundamentally fair trial. She can go out in church, call them racists in nationally publicized speeches, say that she's on the side of God, they are not, and that 
she's on the right side of justice as a prosecutor and that it requires her disqualification. He says, there's nothing I can find in the law that says I can throw you out. But the judge provides some, some, uh, some reassurance here, but it was still legally improper. Mm -hmm. Providing this type of public comment creates dangerous waters for the DA to wade further into. The time may well have arrived for an order preventing the state from mentioning the case in any public forum to prevent prejudicial pretrial publicity. But that's not the motion before us today. And so the defense motions demanding disqualification and dismissal because she called them racists and demons opposed to God, that is denied from Judge McAfee. Now, as we come to the close of his order, he says the defendants invoke a range of other constitutional, statutory, and county provisions that support disqualifying Fannie, like the trustee clause and various provisions about Fannie violating her disclosure and hiring violations under Georgia law. Now, as to the latter, McAfee says a district attorney may appoint private attorneys to assist with criminal cases independent of any specific statutory authorization. This statute does not place limitations on the appointment of a Wade to work on a specific case as opposed to county approval of a general employee. And so while Wade's contract did not limit his work to any particular case, the testimony establishes much, and the defense have not produced any evidence demonstrating that his work ever expanded beyond his prosecution. And so further, to the extent that the defense argues that the circumstances of Wade's loyalty oath create independent grounds for disqualification, the court incorporates our previous order and denies that as well. Now, as for the remaining provisions and arguments, the court has not been presented with any authority that such violations, even if proven, amount to an actual conflict of interest, nor that an appearance of impropriety can apply to any instance of inappropriate or wrongful behavior. In each case, applying the appearance standard the impropriety was connected in some way to an allegation of potential and previously recognized actual conflict. And so he says in a separate motion, adopting the arguments of her co-defendants, defendant Kathy Latham presents an additional theory. She asserts the right to call the DA as a witness at trial to examine her biases towards the defense, being, being that she brought a political motive, a motivated prosecution. Now, accepting the sole citation raised in support from this other case that allows the impeachment of a prosecutor for improper motives, it requires ignorance of the opinion surrounding context. If you actually read the case and the authority upon which it relies and not simply quote the head note, it reveals the Court of Appeals antiquated use of the word prosecutor referred not to the legal officer handling the case, but rather the main witness for the state. So, so they, they got the case wrong. Defendant Latham asserts a claim accurately categorized as one of selective prosecution. And SCOTUS has recognized that some claims are not a defense on the merits to any of the criminal charges. So instead, a claim of selective prosecution must be brought in the form of a motion asking the court to exercise its judicial power on equal protection grounds. So lacking such a showing there and any foundation in the law or in the rules of evidence, the motion therefore is denied. Now, in conclusion, McAfee says whether this case ends in convictions, acquittals, or something in between, the result should be one that instills confidence in the process. Well, sorry, judge, you just blew that. A reasonable observer unburdened by partisan blinders should believe the law was impartially applied. None of us do. And those accused of crimes had a fair opportunity to present their defenses. Mwah and that any verdict was based on our criminal justice system's best efforts, yeah, at ascertaining the truth. Any distractions that detract from these goals, if remedial under the law, should be proportionally addressed. After considering and consideration of the record established on these motions, the court finds the allegations and evidence legally insufficient to support a finding of an actual conflict of interest, which is just wild. However, the appearance of impropriety remains and must be handled as previously outlined before the prosecution can proceed. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part and denied in part. Judge McAfee, Superior Court, Fulton County, Atlanta, 
judicial circuit. So a pretty blinded opinion, something I think that is weak and intentionally weak. I think the judge has willful blinders on. He is saying, putting his ears, his fingers in his ears, la, 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 I don't know what happened here. I can't decide a bunch of this stuff. And it's kind of even Stevens. We're going to put Fannie Willis and give her a bunch of credibility, even though we know that she doesn't have any credibility. We're going to put her on even par with other defendants, witnesses, and call it a wash, but not really call it a wash. They're both bad, but only one of them is bad enough that they need to go. We can live and remain with one bad prosecutor. And so very, very weak and very disappointing, actually. I don't know what kind of pressures came down to bear upon this judge in the court of public opinion or whether he thinks this is going to save him or whether this will cause Robert Patillo or his other contenders to drop out and whether he's trying to secure his position there, whether he's trying to just live in Fulton County. He's got a three-year-old and a five-year-old and he may not want to deal with the repercussions there. But it is absolutely blind to everything that we saw and what happened in his courtroom, which were cover-ups and lies were being spread about directly to his face. And he's allowing it to continue. Now, some silver linings on this, I would say, is that there are still a bunch of other remedial options that are afoot. And so some good news that comes out of this, obviously this delayed the case three full months. And so it's gonna take some time to get this back on track, especially if Nathan Wade gets the boot. It would be amazing if Fanny says, I'm going to appeal this. Nathan Wade's amazing or something. That would be insane of her to do that. But case was delayed. The lead special prosecutor is going to be now gone. Somebody else is going to have to pick up the slack. Question is, can they get this case back on track before the election, which has ultimately been their end game? And I think the answer to that is probably no. Now, we've also talked about this, okay? Fanny staying on the case is not the absolute worst outcome here. The worst outcome would have been this case goes to somebody who's actually competent, right? Fanny is like a lightning rod. She stands out above all of the other prosecutions that exist in America currently being waged against Trump as the symbol of the corruption. And I think a lot of people will take her, her persona and her corruption and that will signify the entire effort. So the splash zone from big Fannie Willis will spill over into the other cases, which I think will be very good in the court of public opinion. And it will show you know, really how corrupted the law has become. And as we explained, right, the county attorney is a, an extremely profoundly powerful position. And the gears of power that they move is massive. So case was delayed. Question about the six charges that were dismissed. Turns out, maybe that's exactly what many thought it was. Judge McAfee was giving the defense a bone before he is not dismissing or disqualifying Fannie, but it's still going to cause a rift. Okay, Fannie's case just got cut pretty badly. She's going to lose her special counsel, her special prosecutor, and she's got now six charges that were all gone. So she has to decide whether to reindict those and she's got to get a new attorney back on the case. Judge made some conversation about the state bar, right? Saying it's foul odor. This was inappropriate, not legally permissible, but I can't get rid of you. So he's kind of writing for the other entities, right? This is kind of a punt. He's kicking this off to the state bar. You also heard him talk about Fannie not being reelected. Maybe the people will be upset about this. Probably not. Fannie will probably be out in front of church talking about how she, you know, survived a racist onslaught from the MAGA crowd or whatever. So that could be a solution, right? She could not get, get reelected. There, of course, are still the immunity claims, which we have seen nothing about yet, so far as I know, in the Georgia case, and that could cause a big delay. And we also have Kemp's new prosecutorial oversight bill which was just signed into law by him in Georgia. And so there are, you know, a lot, there's a lot of runway left on this case. And the government, Fannie, right, is going to be responding to this. And we'll see what she says when that time comes. We did have some reaction from Steve Sadow. 
he already came out. He posted an update. Here's what he says. He says, the lead defense counsel for Trump issues the following statement. Trump's defense attorney, Sadow, says, while respecting the court's decision, we believe that it did not afford appropriate significance to the prosecutorial misconduct of Willis and Wade, including the financial benefits, testifying untruthfully about when their personal relationship began, as well as Willis's extrajudicial MLK church speech, where she played the race card and falsely accused the defendants and their counsel of racism. Will we use all legal options available? We will use all options available as we continue to fight to end this case, which should never have been brought in the first place. Amuse, our friend Amuse on X asks this great question. Will Big Fanny betray her lover and stay on the case or is she gonna do the right thing and withdraw? So good questions. Let's see if there's anything else from Steve. Nothing else from Steve. So we've got him. Phil Holloway, of course, has broken some news on this and been very involved in the Georgia case. He says the Fannie Willis order is ridiculous. Okay, so Wade has to go. That's it. Willis can stay. No weight was given to Yurdy, who saw them hugging and kissing. Totally unbelievable. Says, sadly, this reflects the political reality now that the judge has two opponents in the election to be held in May. He inflicted no real damage to Fannie. And this keeps your political machine from turning on him at a time when he can't afford that. It might be a foregone conclusion. He might lose anyways. Phil says, no need to hear from Cindy Yeager, the prosecutor, who says she has personal knowledge of witness tampering. Nope. Just mind-bogglingly stupid. And this order is ridiculously illogical. It is because he's saying it's obviously bad. Someone needs to go. But if Nathan needs to go, doesn't that also implicate Fanny's judgment and she was a part of that? So you just separate them and now her judgment is suddenly like beyond reproach? No, that's not how it works. So that's some great reaction, my friends. And of course, we're waiting to see if Fanny Willis has responded to this or if there's any you know, fallout from her office. Of course, we want to hear from you and see what you say about all this. And we're going to jump into your comments and your questions just doing a quick search to see if her office has responded to anything that is out there. And it doesn't look like they have. So, all right, my friends, a um, uh, 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 wild opinion, you know, about, I think what some people were expecting, it's kind of splitting the baby, coping and weasel, you know, weaseling out, honestly, kicking this down the road in a very weak, weak opinion not doing what absolutely should have been done. But now let's hear from you, my friends. I saw some very generous super chats and donos come in. Let's see what you say about all this. And then we'll jump over to watchingthewatchers.locals.com for our members only after party. Let's see what you guys say about this. What's up, Mike? Mike S is in the house. Very nice to see you, Mike. Thank you for starting us off today. And very nice to see you, Mike. We got, what's up, Lisa? Lisa's here. What's up, Lisa? Welcome aboard, Lisa. Thanks for becoming a supporter. We'll see you in the members only streams. Dear Woke Christian says, grace and peace. Glad to see we watch on YouTube. Good to see you, Dear Woke Christian. And Crash is here. Says, well, we know who he is now. Unless there is more in his order, even a Federalist Society judge, it would appear, is subject to persuasion of the political class. That is the swamp. If he fails to address the perjury, which he has, the swamp has proven their tentacles reach far, wide, and deep. He basically didn't even talk about the perjury because he didn't find the condition was met to question their affidavit. I don't know when the relationship started. Therefore, there's no perjury. Very convenient. Says, in Judge McAfee's court, in the very first hearing, he addresses tangentially the prosecution's penchant for hiding nuggets in the voluminous discovery, like Jack and the Washington Monuments. McAfee called it the needle in the haystack effect. I thought he was going to be a straight shooter. Seems I was wrong. <clears throat> yeah, I'm disappointed too. I am disappointed. I was hopeful that he would do the right thing, but it's hard to do. Very hard to disqualify a DA. Leanne Leanne says, good morning. So disheartening to hear Judge McAfee's ruling. Imagine Fanny Pants and her double, in, double entitled arrogance now. 
I truly thought McAfee would see this for what it is, corruption. You just can't win. Well, I think there's going to be a silver lining here. I hope Fanny leads the trial because she's a terrible attorney. And it's going to be a lot of fun to watch. Aaron A. is here. Welcome aboard, Aaron A. Maggie has been a membo for two months. Says corruption's okay in Fulton County. Apparently it is. It's just how things go. Like, we'll see Like we'll see what the bar does. I mean, if the judge is okay, we'll see. If, does the bar care? Is, is Fanny much more powerful than we even know? Like she's, you know, queen of Fulton County. No one can touch her. Chubby's here. Says, sad to see McAfee take the compromise route. I'm curious though, can the defense still file motions to dismiss on the other misdeeds not ruled on in this motion? Yeah, I guess it would depend what the misdeeds are. Since he seems to have only ruled on the conflict of interest aspect, can they move to dismiss based on Fanny's perjury or Wade's? No, that was, that's included in here. Or on the DA's office subordinating perjury of Bradley, I would say that's all included in this filing. So I would say no. Other misconduct that's outside of what we talked about, yes, but this, I would say, the judge would say that's all dealt with in this one. Rob says, I think we all are a little confused. Remember the hearing was about Nathan Wade being disqualified and removed? That's all the judge can rule on, in my opinion. Fanny has to be under another complaint. No, I think it was the full office from the beginning. And Fanny was the, you know, the origin source of the conflict. She's the one who appointed him. Guess is here. Says, my favorite part is when you slap the chair. Yeah, it gets so irritated. Gosh, thank you, Guess. Yeah, you know, that's, that's good it's there. And it's pretty solid, too. Thank you, Guess. Joel R., nice dono, says, Little Judge McAfee punted this one to the appeals court because he didn't want his little Mac roasted on CNN and MSNBC. I really thought he was fair and balanced. Boy, I was wrong. Well, you're not alone on that one, Joel. I was hopeful. You know, I, I like to try to stay optimistic on these things and hope that they do the right thing thing, but obviously that didn't happen here. Politics is strong, man. Justice is, you know, on the run in, in America. Rob says, Fanny is a witness in the case against Nathan Wade. Nathan Wade's business partner is a witness in the Nathan Wade case. Fanny can now be brought up in a case of disqualification, disbarment, and prosecution. It would, it would, yeah, I mean, if somebody maybe prosecuted her, but I don't think that's happening. Joel R. is here. What's up, Joel? Bringing in 10 new membos. Bringing in Schechter, Sean, Juanita B., Nicole B., Marcia J., Wayne H., Christopher B., Kristen L., Adi Joe, and Chris C. All coming in, courtesy of Joel R. Bringing in new membos. Thank you, Joel. Very grateful to have you. Thanks for bringing in our newest of membos. We got T. Lewis says, Rob, Fanny may be better for the case than a more competent attorney, but this ruling will only embolden her to find other ways to continue the corruption. Yeah, and I, I think the problem is, is, you know, Fanny's facade is crumbling. I think, honestly, there's probably going to be more corruption. There'll be more evidence. There'll be more whistleblowers. You know, this might, like the dam may have already been broken. So this, this victory might be very fleeting. We'll see. I hope. Jeffrey Sane says, how could the judge find benefit to Fanny immaterial? Because he didn't want to disqualify her. That's, that's why he did that. Appealable for abuse of discretion? I don't know. And why say prejudice to the defense, not consider then say D is not prejudiced by the Fanny acts? I, I agree. I mean, the whole prosecution is prejudice, in my opinion. But he was just really working to not disqualify her. Leaf blower guy! is in the house. He says, thanks for hitting that like button, my friends. Leaf blower guy in the house. And this one from Anunnaki, descendant, says, Judge McAfee says, quote, no job is worth my integrity. Well, that statement didn't age very well. I guess he has too much of a coward to actually follow the evidence, the law, and the obvious legal decision to disqualify Fanny. We've got this one from Deham says, if there is an appearance of misconduct, wouldn't the easiest solution be to disqualify the DA, you know, and reassign the case? It's a great idea, D. Ham. You're right. That is the real, the real outcome. Why didn't Judge McAfee do that? Only one's bad. They both don't have to go. Only one. We can live with 50% corruption, not 100% non-corruption. Liberty or death, good to see you, D. Ham. Hey, some guy with cancer says... This ruling is an example of why trust in the judiciary is lower than Fanny's ethics. 
Yeah, I mean, it's really deflating that our justice system functions this way in, in any, anywhere in this country. Liberty or Death says, McAfee's opinion sounds like he and James Comey would be best friends. Just kind of manipulating around the margins, grossly negligent, becomes extremely careless like they did with Hillary. Voice of the People says, I'm just going to say it. We need to rebuild all our institutions. Remember what our constitution says about a tyrannical government. Maybe Kazakhstan had a point. I had to reword the government line. I couldn't super what it says. Well, thank you for that, voice of the people. Thanks for being a membo. Our institutions do have a lot of rot to them, and the political process seems to have corrupted what's happening in Fulton County for sure. Thank you, voice. We got work to do, man. That's why we're here. Chubby says, sorry if this was already asked. Was just listening, not watching for a bit. Can any of this be appealed? I, I presume so. I don't see why not. Especially since McAfee didn't allow all of the evidence to be included. He made this ruling, but refused to reopen the evidence trial when the defense was approached by even more witnesses. You're right. He did. And I, I presume that it can be appealed. I don't, I don't, don't know why it wouldn't, but you know, I don't practice exactly in Georgia. So at, at all in Georgia. So more will be revealed on that one. But yeah, I presume that it can. And his justification for not reopening the evidence was he already had what he needed on it. So is that an abuse of discretion? We'll see. Shri, what's up, Shri? Bringing in five members, Catherine H., Swamp S., Janet W., Kevin H., and Drive For Your Life coming in thanks to Shri bringing in the newest of members. JK says, our judicial system just got bad news and it's terminal illness. If you think an election will fix this, you're delusional. Yeah, I think that's probably right, Jake, right? You know, there's something much broader than just who's in charge the next four years. There's a, there's a, you know, our society is multi-layered and there is a systemic rot through the layers. Patrick R says McAfee's ruling is material defective, materially defective on the face of it. He points out that Willis and Wade meet the criteria for both of them, but then he disqualifies one of them. Right. Exactly right. Like both of them are, one of you's got to go. You're both bad. I don't care. Pick one and we'll let the other bad one stay. All right. Here's Kevlar says, and judge didn't need further evidence of their corruption. Mine was made up. Yeah. Didn't want to hear from, didn't want to hear from, um, the cell phone guy, the prosecutor, or the law professor. This old guy says, I gave McAfee the benefit of the doubt. Boy, I was so wrong. McAfee's a coward. And his new email, this is a joke, is coward at fultoncounty.gov. That's a joke. It's not his real email. SoCal Boho Gal says, our justice system is broken. Certainly in some areas, it absolutely is. Suck it up, buttercup. Defund the police needs to happen. The lawless are free while the free are being enslaved. Those entrusted with the law have become the most lawless indeed. Trump needs to appeal. I was going to see if Sadow said that they would pursue that or what, but haven't seen that yet thus far. We got TW1G says McAfee has had this nonsense written out for at least a week. He was decided as soon as the seat challenger was presented. We'll see if that changes. Isn't it going to be interesting? If McAfee's competitors suddenly decide that they don't want to run anymore. Mrs. Mom is here, says court, no financial benefit. The world says BS. This is a kangaroo court. I think you're right about that, Mrs. Mom. It does feel like it is a not accurate opinion. Crisis at the border says, can the judge be brought in front of the ethics committee? Very angry in Jupiter, Florida. Love you. Thanks for keeping us all informed. Thank you, crisis at the border. Yeah, maybe, I mean, if somebody were to submit an ethical complaint, but I don't know that he breached his ethics. He just wrote a really bad opinion, which I don't think was accurate at all. Chubby says, McAfee is unbelievable, particularly with the expenditures and the reimbursement mental Olympics he performed. Defense provides several instances of financial benefit, but he dismisses all of them because Fannie provides a single document of just one purchase. Just wow, I know. T. Lewis says, wouldn't this ruling hurt Jocelyn? Since McAfee is ruling that there was no financial misconduct, can Wade's divorce attorney state that Jocelyn could not prove that Wade was hiding money from her? From what I'm understanding, that divorce has yet to be finalized 
and Wade is only paying temporary and spouse dependent money. So couldn't this affect any monetary settlement in the divorce? I think, I think maybe it could, but I think that it was settled before because remember, uh, Fannie Willis was actually subpoenaed to come and testify in the, the divorce. And then Jocelyn said, we don't need to have that hearing anymore. I think it's because she got everything she wanted. So I don't think it's going to have an impact. Carol M says, Rob, why would Judge McAfee risk his integrity in, in his character by this ruling? You, you got it. You answered your own question. Or is the election more important than Fannie's future? Yeah, I think it's probably. He's a young judge. He's in Fulton County. He's facing local pressure, probably political pressure from the federal level. Pressure in the court of public opinion influenced the decision in the court of law. Knox is here, says TGIF all, as at the lead attorney said, Regarding Bradley, what can you give when you are built like a Coke can? Information in Bradley's case and contracts in Fanny's. Good to see you, Knox. Michael M. says, toddler is teething. 12 months! We got a one-year anniversary and a three-month-old. He's teething. Is that what happens at three months? Good to know. Thank you, Michael Manson. Thanks for being a membo for a full year, my friend. Great to have you. Hey, Just Rhonda says, all I want to know is can this ruling be appealed I would say the general answer is yes, right? I always answer yes on that question. Lady Ice says, I'm so disappointed in these judges, unless it's the Supreme Court. I'm so disappointed in these judges and how they bend over backwards to justify these bogus cases, be it out of fear or politics. Either way, this is a shame on our justice system. Can this be appealed to a higher court? Yes. Is there any remedy? Yes, we talked about them. And what about meeting with the VP to which she lied on the stand about? Yeah, well, Judge didn't seem to think any of that impacted her credibility, unfortunately. Roger Needham says the waiving of the forensic misconduct is abhorrent. Vote him out. Yeah, now he may just be catching it from both sides, right? He may catch it from all the people who are needing him to stand up. And now he's got, you know, a new competitor who's who may have a shot at beating him anyways, even without all this Trump stuff. Crash says... Fannie knew the former governor would never take the case. He said he was making too much money on the stand. Fannie was creating plausible deniability. I hired the hot dog because no one else wanted the case. Knox says, I'd move for a change of venue ASAP. Move it up to Walton Co. I sponsor an animal shelter there. It's full of white hillbilly dog dumpers. Oh man, dog dumpers, rude. Knox says, or Babs here says, McAfee worked for Fannie. Why didn't he recuse himself? Squirrel says, something I don't recall seeing how was how far in advance were the cruises scheduled. People don't just up and buy tickets for a cruise. Well, remember that Nathan Wade had a cruise guy, so they could just, I guess, you know, fast track the whole process. Thank you, Squirrel. Nice dono. Mac Ryan, what's up, Mac? Thanks for the support and for being here and joining us. Uncle 60 says, if you were Wade and got fired, would you sue Georgia for wrongful termination? Uh, No but I would also not do anything else Nathan Wade did. In my opinion, guilty Fanny can't fire Wade for doing the same thing. Mac Ryan says, this is the same thing that the Dem Senator said. Triangulation among, amongst thieves from Mac Ryan. We've got, I'd rather be skiing says, can the defense use this to remove the judge for clear bias and inability to get a fair trial in Georgia? No, I don't think that that would be fruitful. Like a notice for a change of judge. It's his decision, and he you know, has some reasoning behind it, even if it sounds ridiculous. SD 1985 says, if Fannie dumps Wade, what are the chances of her finding another prosecutor willing to do the job? Well, she's also got the other two. So presumably, they would just pick up the slack and take it from there. Roger Neham says, you do up and buy tickets when your income is $35,000 a month, and that money's coming in with a permanent government contract that was gifted to you by your girlfriend. Yeah, maybe maybe that's true. Why not? Hey, this one from Ms. J. Nine months, we got a baby in the house, Ms. J. Says, I feel so let down. I had so much faith in this judge. I know, it's disappointing, isn't it? It, it's, it kinda, it feels gross. Knox Beerman is sharing this one. Waltonpets.net is a good website to check out. Cora McGarver, what's up, Cora? Says, this case makes my head spin. You're not alone. 
we're all in a twisted world of bizarro land, courtesy of Judge McAfee. Mac Ryan says, this whole thing stinks. He is a coward. Lady Ice says, so apparently, when he wanted to be able to look his kids in the eyes about this decision, he meant literally wanted to be alive for them, to be alive, to be able to look them into the eyes. What a coward. How corrupt is this state? It's pretty bad. We got B Torn says, this ruling is, as my kids would say, sketch. Chubby says, can a judge be found guilty of suborning perjury that happened in their own courtroom if they knowingly ignore it and leave the offender undisciplined? This is clearly what McAfee is doing here. T. Lewis says, I'm an unreasonable deplorable. Chris S. says, this one coming up, seeing this one coming from day one, too much corruption from the ground up from Chris S. And you kind of, you know, you kind of hope that this that, that doesn't happen that way, but it does. Milo phone bill says, I'm a contract engineer. I can bill my client 40 hours a week or about 173 hours per month. If authorized, I can bill for more. How many hours out of a normal work week is billable for prosecutors? Was Nathan Wade hired part-time? I think at the first contract he was, but then his hours went up as the case progressed. Shi Zhang the Great is our newest supporter. Welcome aboard, Shi Zhang. Very nice to have you as our newest supporter. Aretha says the judge split the baby because he's up for re-election. If this case got squashed, he would be blamed and he wants to win. He can't have the case moved because it's a gem for him as well. Yeah, it, yeah, I think you might be right about that. Political pressure came down to bear. Thank you, Aretha. Londo says prosecutorial perjury must be considered a complete betrayal of the judicial branch of government and thus is treason. Liberty says, I hope Sadow appeals the decision and asks for mandamus and an interlocutory appeal. McAfee's opinion is insane. He actually said that the public opinion was a factor. Comey in a black robe. Lady Ice says, so no impropriety, just the appearance of impropriety. So I didn't actually see them have intercourse at the office, but other people might think they did. That's ridiculous. Even if each of the numerous violations and outright crimes individually do not present enough evidence to remove them both when considered in totality, there is an overwhelming amount of improper and illegal conduct that should leave no other option but to remove. Xi Zhang says it's virtually impossible without complete cases to impeach an elected DA. It's not because they are above the law, but we have some respect for the electorate as well as the immunity standard. Yeah, it is hard. It's very hard to remove them. <clears throat> but this case, I think, presents plenty of evidence to support the, the need. Xi Zhang says the reason for disqualification would undermine previous and ongoing prosecutions, right? And they didn't want the domino effect that would cause other cases to also be dismissed. 59 Minutes Presents says, I called this one the day McAfee dropped the six counts. You got it, 59. This one from Truth says, Rob, as I listen to you, this, this question kept coming up in my mind. Have we had enough yet? Have we the people had enough? This will only stop when we decide we've had enough. Lady I says, we aren't asking that every witness be truthful, just the DA and the prosecutor. That would be really nice. Jane Catherine B says, we should not ignore the fact that Fannie Willis is currently being investigated on several matters by the Georgia State Legislature Committee. Her disqualification is in their hands. Chubby says, McAfee's statement about the obligation of the court in regards to false testimony was his way of saying he's not going to even touch any of the blatant perjury and thus the suborning thereof and just ignore it. He's protecting Fannie and the DA's office by ignoring and basically condoning their felonious actions in his courtroom. Unbelievable. Shi Zhang says, let's be honest about what's really going to happen. Fannie's cases are going to fall apart. She's likely going to get thrown to the wolves of the Georgia State and Bar. She's already done. Chewy T, a membo for five months, says the judiciary is dead. Michelle P says, due to the widespread coverage of this case, hasn't the jury pool been tainted for all the defendants in the RICO case? How can they get a fair trial now? Yeah, and, and Fanny, I guess, can just go back to the church and say whatever she wants. It's like fair game now. So she can happen. She can continue 
to do the same thing. Apparently, it's not that big of a problem at all in Georgia. Robert A. says, what happens when the American people lose faith in our laws and courts? Oh, well, the system just breaks down. Yeah, because if you don't have any, if you don't have a justice system, nothing else can really work. Like you can't contract with people because if someone breaks a contract, there's no remedy. And you're, you're seeing it, really. I mean, you're going to see, I think, more criminality. You're going to see, you know, it's cause and effect. It's the Hegelian dialectic. It's, you know, a problem. It, it's, it's thesis, antith antithesis, and then synthesis, right? Problem, reaction, solution. You know, defund the police, cause crime, bring in the federal government, big government solution. Same thing. So the courts will fail. People will demand action and then we'll get a worse court system with less freedoms. We got Jesus Freak says Comey, Clinton, her, Biden, and now McAfee, Willis, clown show. Lady Ice says no other cases of forensic misconduct because no one has been this blatant about it. Seems pretty freaking egregious to me. Bab says, I bet McAfee had Fanny review this before he released it. Uh, Dan, a membo for seven months, two months to a baby, says our judiciary. Sally says, guess he can tell his kids he's a coward. That will be his legacy. Deham says, so he displays every instance of misconduct and says they are not bad enough. How many instances of, quote, almost bad enough does it take for it to be taken as a whole as bad? This does not look good. You're right about that, Deham. Yeah, hopefully he sleeps well tonight. Cyrus J says, so appealing this will stay this decision. When will the appeal take place? Whenever the attorneys decide to do that and they'll have to request the stay of the underlying trial if they do that. This one from Damo says, I'm so angry. I'm not even American. I did stupidly believe he would keep his integrity and do the right thing. He Has he got a public email address? This one from Jennifer. Even with Fanny staying on the case, what about all those Nathan Wades hired under her? Do they all get to stay involved? Yeah, I think Nathan Wade is the only person the judge said was conflicted. Milo phone bill says McAfee has his blinders on, decides either Nathan or Fanny needs to go. So the case continues. Roy MC says, even though it isn't a good outcome, the judge's words must surely limit what Willis and her team can say in public about this case. Certain comments made could be counter to the judgment. Morris Crawford is a membo coming aboard. Welcome, Morris. Londo says Democrats always return to evil, even to those who attempt to appease them. Marcus Aurelius is here. We got K KNNS says, I stand corrected. This judge disappoints. Bob O says, reads more like a family court decision than a criminal court decision. Joanne B with a very nice dono. Thank you so much, Joanne. Very generous of you today. Kelly Sell now says, this is a disappointment. Don't know. Womp, womp. I know. It's a bummer, but thank you, Kelly. B-Man says, Trump's lawyers will tear this case apart. 12 months for Catania Mama Italia. A membo for 12 months. Can this ruling be appealed? Yes. Ray K says, seems like so much for appeal. Would love to hear the Anna Cross story, maybe as a book. Beth says, welcome aboard, Beth. Grateful to have you. We got Navy Styles says, I seem to recall one of the lawyers saying a couple weeks back that they have grounds to bring this case again if Fanny isn't removed. Joe B, can the defense submit a motion to dismiss making their equal protection argument because of the church speech? Not anymore. Truthfinder says, Judge McAfee might have just opened the floodgates of whistleblowers and though she is burned to come forward and testify, both in the state or even with Jim Jordan. Marcus Aurelius says, how would this have played out if the case went before the jury? Good question on that one. Joanne B says, how can an AG prosecute a case when she's the biggest, biggest liar? Plus cash from the campaign. Does she go to the laundromat to get her cash? Or the evidence locker? We don't know, Joanne. Londo says, no one has a big enough finger to plug the crack in this case. Stay tuned. Lil Rock is here as our newest supporter. Welcome aboard, Lil Rock. Chubby Stubby says, here's just an extra tip for putting up with all my questions. Thank you, Chubby. Great questions today. Hey, Joanne just came in as a supporter. Welcome aboard, Joanne. We got new membos coming in, courtesy of Shijong. Thank you, Shijong. Bringing in Patricia M. 
Bella E, Jim F, Amy C, Cheryl B, J Water, Mag Z, Wheezy Bob, Mr. Otter Pockets, Cheryl P, Nana's here, Ghost G, Boiler Operator, Justin Y, Dennis S, Quentin D, Carlos A, Barbaric Brit, Mr. Mike M, and Chinny W, all coming in courtesy of our friend Shi Zhang the Great. Thank you for bringing in 20 new members, Shi Zhang. Very grateful for you. Gordon B, Optics, Kemp signs the new bill. McAfee lets Fanny skate. So maybe the new committee will take care of it. GNR Lawn Service, what are the chances that Fanny gets taken off the case now? Zero, unfortunately. Merms says, it's a shame that McAfee only disqualify one of the viruses in Fulton County. Very disappointing. Terry E, what's up, Terry E? Welcome aboard as our new supporter. And Londo says, did the judge design this ruling to fail? Ryan F says, this is why it's important to have lifelong Supreme Court justices so they don't waffle to political pressures. Trump et al. will just appeal until it gets to a justice who doesn't have to split the baby to stay in office. Yeah, it was pretty gross to watch how quickly the, the tides changed after the announcement of that election. Felix says, the only remedy for the country is an Article 5 convention of the states. It's sad to see this in the USA. We could say that this only happens in other countries, but now we are like other countries. Article 5, Convention of the States now. <clears throat> yeah, but there's a lot of blue states out there. Like my concern is what if they come in and like they shatter what's left of the Bill of Rights. They say that is no longer around, right? They formulate a new country based on, you know, AOC and Pete Buttigieg's visions. Roy MC, thank you, Felix. Very nice dono. Thank you for sending that in today. Roy MC says... I think Trump and the others will wait to see what Fannie does after this judgment before appealing. I think you're right. Yeah, there's still some decompression ahead. Little Rock says, Rob, I'm an attorney in Arkansas. I have an inactive license in Arizona. I'm working a case here with Robert Barnes. I just found you recently. Hey, shout out to our fellow attorneys in Arkansas. Cool, and you're working with Barnes. Shout out to our friends, Robert Barnes. Very nice to meet you, Little Rock. Thanks for swinging by our stream. Austin B says, isn't the ruling kind of genius? It states Fannie can either recuse herself or Wade can recuse himself. Doesn't that mean Fannie doesn't have a choice unless she can force Wade? Yeah, I mean, according to the judge's order, one of them definitely has to go. So someone's going, but it should be, it should be both of them. They're both bad. They both lied. They should, should both go. V is never silent, says, could his decision have to do with all the cases and pending decided under Fanny. Opening that can of, can of worms could be costly for Fulton County, right? Yeah. Yeah, because every defense attorney is going to be saying that she should be disqualified from their case because she's a liar, which is why he didn't find that she was a liar. He didn't you know, find that she lied in his courtroom <clears throat> to avoid calling her a liar because in every other case in, Fan in Fulton would be problematic. Wild Things Forever says, forgot to tip, LOL. I think this is the best outcome. Delay, appeal, delay, appeal, delay all the way through 2024. Yes, it's the best next option. The best option would have been the whole case gets dismissed and Fanny got indicted. Wild Things says, hey, forgot to tip. I think it's the best outcome. Real, Real with Robo says, I'm submitting complaints to the ethics and to the Bar Association. Real with Robo, a membo for one month. Hey, Kish the Neat. Hey, what's up, Kish? Welcome aboard as our newest supporter. Glad to have you. We got Real with Robo says, here's a dono for your brother to get another CD he likes. Thank you, Real with Robo. I will. Actually, I just got him one. I got him, what was it? Um, I forget what it was. I just got him some CD. I forget what it was. Thank you for that, Real with Robo. B.H. Williams says, people up and book a cruise all the time. If you like cruising, you either buy very early or last minute. You buy early because they'll upgrade your rooms as they continue to sell the lower rooms. You buy last minute because they're trying to fill empty, fill empty rooms and they offer deals. My, my wife worked for an airline in the early 2000s and we last minute cruised a couple of times. Just say it straight. Sejong the Great. Sejong the Great in the house. Thank you, Sejong. We got Wild Thing says, I think the judge would have done better on the right, but he has chosen to go down the left road. Guess he's hoping that Trump loses. I think he chose the wrong road. No. N Kish the Neat. 
says the judge may be doing Trump a favor by giving a strong chance on appeal. This this pushes forward a horrible case with an incompetent prosecutor. Ryan F. is joining us as a supporter. Welcome aboard, Ryan. Glad to have you. Sejong says, if you expected a city level or even a state level judge to take Fannie to the cleaners, you were mistaken. This one from Gigum. We'll let, look at that one later. We got this one from Kensden says, not shocked by the political decision, but his prior decision removing six counts weakened her case. And this one seems to be giving her a golden bridge to get out. Is she smart enough to take it? I don't think so. This is her entire career. She is, you know, riding this one to the end. Felix says, Judge Joe Brown is saying that this ruling would be a good foundation for appeals courts after convictions. Yeah, but the judge doesn't want to be appealed. Like the judge, like being appealed is not a good thing for a judge. So like he's not writing this in order to get appealed. He wanted it to be solid. Sejong says, the ruling prosecution will not delete Fanny, but her case is unusually diminished. This is what is known as a tainted prosecution. And if she doesn't recuse and restart the investigation, even if she is running it, she is horribly diminished, right? Yeah, there's the albatross that just hangs around her neck now throughout the remainder of the case. Joe Maz. Rob, to soothe your worries about a convention of the states, the convention is to propose amendments, which still require three-fourths of the state to ratify. Should proposal of all amendments be from Congress? No, uh, no but I'm just saying, that, like, at least now we have the remnants of a Bill of Rights. What happens if, if three-fourths of the states say we don't need that anymore? That's my concern. Like the Bill of Rights is in tatters, but we at least we have it. If we, what if we came back and somebody just had a whole new idea and like, you know, I get worried about the tyranny of the majority because it's problematic. Marcus Aurelius says, can other defense lawyers in the future refer to this case for getting out of perjury under oath per their client's testimony? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think this judge is, you know, he didn't, he didn't say that they were perjured, that, that, that they perjured themselves or anything. So I don't think there's any precedent there, unfortunately. Londo, what's up? Says, forgot the tip. Thank you for that, Londo. And thank you for those very generous donos, my friends. Very grateful for those. Let's see who is joining us on X before we go over to locals for our members only after party. And we'd love to see you come over there and join us. Who's here on the day? Vienti Kiss. We got Flagpole Guy, Freedom Gear. Says my new flag showing off in the AZ winds. Love it. Beautiful flags. V says happy cash Friday. The C-SPAN review is here. It says Fulton County has been corrupt for a hundred years. Captain Salty. We got Mary O. K zeros. Feline fun says doesn't really feel like a win. V is never silent. Kossi's critter says so much for integrity over there. And it is great to see everybody, Salty Sarge, Joe Miller, and our other friends on the X. But that, my friends, is it for us on the day. A reminder, if you haven't already joined us, go to watcherlodge.com. We've got an amazing event coming up tomorrow, and it is called the Discover Your Purpose and Goals Worksheet, and it's going to be a ton of fun. So tomorrow, 1030 Mountain Time, <clears throat> uh, 1030 Arizona Time, Pacific Time. 1.30 Eastern time. Go sign up for this, watcherlodge.com. It's going to be a ton of fun. We also have our website, robertgovea.com, which is where you can get the PDFs that we read through today. And of course, watching the watchers.locals.com, which is where we're heading over right now to debrief on the day. And so we will see you over there, my friends. Before we wrap it up, I want to thank our mods and our meme smiths who mod the fort down for us. Our friends, Vienticus Prime, K Bean in the house, Just Cause, Playing Hooky, Ronnie Cole, Zulu, Beyond Geo, Zach Nichols, John Allen, Janek, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, all modding the fort down for us. Shout outs to Sleepy Dog Lee, Nathan N810, and Gigum Gigum, modding the fort down for us, my friends. That is it for us on the day. We are going to leave it there and go over to locals. My friends, I hope you have yourselves an amazing, beautiful weekend. We will not be back here for a stream later tonight. And so we'll be back here on Monday to get into it all again. I hope you have an amazing weekend. 
You spend time with friends and family, get outside, get some fresh air, get some good rest, rejuvenate those energy tanks because we're going to be back here on Monday to get into it again. And we need to see you right back here so that together with your help, we can shine that big, beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Make it a beautiful night, my friends, and a beautiful weekend. We'll see you right back here on Monday. Bye-bye.